Hello and welcome to uh, the Thermodynamics module, uh, lecture number 14, where we're going to continue our story uh, on entropy. Um, you may recall that we came up with this formula. ds uh, is equal to uh, delta es plus delta is. Um, uh, where on the left hand side we this is our change of property this is the entropy uh, and on this side we have this is delta q over t plus delta i s so these are increments of transfer of entropy so this is our exchange entropy this is uh, what we mean by that exchange uh, uh, transfer uh, of ent entropy from the surrounds of the system uh, uh, through heat transfer. Uh, this thing here was our production entropy, delta I, S was greater or equal to zero. Uh, and that uh, is not a transfer term, uh, it's a term that produces entropy from within the system. Uh, gradients being flattened out, this type of thing, uh, essentially. Um, with energy levels being uh, particles adopting uh, uh, the more favourable energy levels, uh, the most common is essentially uh, states, uh, then uh, we find that uh, we get entropy production taking place uh, within the within the system itself. Um, and uh, you may recall how we got to this. Um, uh, essentially, we looked at uh, Clausius inequality, uh, and we came. We looked at the idea of reversibility because when we had a reversible uh, process, uh, so we found that we this thing collapses down, we get this thing equal to zero, and we find that we have this thing ds is equal to um, delta qr over t. Um, and this was, a, this was a way we could, if we wanted to, uh, uh, calculate entropy. Um, it's generally, we don't tend to use this formula, to be honest. Uh, it's uh, generally because um, it's a bit contrived. You have to sort of think of ways to supply the heat um, reversibly. Um, and it can be, a, it, um, uh, it usually means that you have to bring a temperature up uh, wherever the temperature is of the system, you have to bring some temperature alongside it. That has uh, an infinitesimal difference between them. That's how you do it. Um, uh, and that you have to do some conceptual thinking to apply it. Uh, in any event, now we know that entropy is a property and we have our true property rule. Uh, quite often the way to get to entropy is um, is by the by the properties, and this is the general way we we will go about finding that. Uh, last time we looked at transport equations, and I just tried to show you that essentially the transport equations for entropy look more or less uh, identical to those of, uh, of, of um, are treated in the same way, if you like, as the energy transport equations, uh, unsteady, unsteady. Uh, but we did have this production term, uh, which came from here, of course, uh, in that equation. Um, and we had no means, essentially, uh, uh, to, to, to work it out directly. Although you could use the rest of the transfer equation to do it if you knew the properties and things. But yeah, that's, uh, that is a possibility. But uh, so, yeah, if we knew the exchange and we knew the change in entropy, then obviously we could, we could figure out what that was. Uh, that's a possibility, certainly. Uh, but to, but the direct uh, the direct um, calculation of that is beyond what we can do on this course. Uh, today, what I want to do, do then is a couple of things I want to do. I'm going to look at um, uh, um, gases. We have to return to gases again and work out uh, the change in entropy for a gas uh, because with gases. As you can imagine, we've got a nice state equation, ideal gases and uh, or perfect gases, a Cp and Cv are constant, um, our heat capacities. Then uh, we can work out very simple formulas, as it turns out. Uh, um, 
And you may recall, for a gas, that energy and uh, enthalpy were just a function of temperature. It's going to turn out that uh, entropy, sorry, yes, internal energy and enthalpy were a function of temperature. Entropy uh, turns out to be a, a not, not just a function of temperature. It is it very much uh, uh, follows our two property rule. It's a function of two, two independent properties. Uh, so we're going to have a look at that. But before I get to that, what I want to do, look at first is to go back and look at uh, our heat engines. And with a view to looking at the statements uh, of the um, of the uh, of the uh, second law of thermodynamics, uh, because in fact you can see probably you can see straight away uh, that uh, that with this identity here, uh, if you've got an isolated system, so if you have a system which is isolated, yeah. So if you isolate it. Uh, so for an isolated system, in other words, there's no mass or there's no energy transfers, then uh, this this exchange entropy uh, is zero. There's no energy transfer, yes? So we find for this system, for an isolated system, system, um, ds, the change in uh, entropy of that system is equal to delta i of s, which is which is greater than zero. Now, a lot of students fall for the trap that entropy always has to be greater than zero. It doesn't. Uh, entropy can be negative or positive. In fact, uh, as temperature goes down, entropy generally drops. So, if I dro uh, and uh, the third, the third law of thermodynamics, uh, with the right provisos about what happens at absolute zero, you can now, as uh, temperature goes to absolute zero, the entropy will go to absolute zero. Um, so that is um, that can happen. So generally, you know, whether you put if you heat things up, entropy will increase. If you cool, uh, if you cool them down, they will generally go down. So entropy, there being a property, can be plus or minus. Uh, well, go up or down essentially, uh, decrease or increase. Uh, if we have an absolute value for entropy, then uh, of course it's, it would probably be positive. But uh, that, that uh, I think I mentioned earlier that the absolute values are, are not coming from classical uh, thermodynamics, they're coming from other theories. But what we can say is that the change in ent entropy for an isolated system uh, uh, is positive, it'll be zero. Uh, if the changes are reversible uh, in the limit, it could be zero. But generally, for any spontaneous change, not driven by work, uh, any process that are going on, you will find the entropy will increase. Uh, this could be the universe, in fact. You could have a, you know, well, the universe could be isolated, you might argue. But generally, the, uh, the, um, this is a, a manifestation of the second law, that, that the, uh, the, entropy, uh, the entropy change for an isolated system is well it's it's uh, it's positive yes it increases uh, it's positive Uh, or possibly in the limit, or in the limit zero. It could be zero, yeah. Uh, that's possible uh, if you, everything's reversible, really. Uh, essentially, this statement, this is what I'm saying. This is the statement. This is what you get from an isolated system. This is the change in entropy. It's positive or zero, really. That's what we're saying. Uh, uh, or the entropy change uh, of the universe, which includes the system and the surroundings, um, due to any spontaneous change, not driven by work, is uh, is um, is positive. So another way of saying that the entropy change of the universe. of the universe, uh, which is system plus surroundings, that's what we mean by universe, 
um, is uh, is positive, is increasing. So, uh, or in the limit, uh, well, uh, during, well, it's put it during, let's put it like that, during any uh, spontaneous change, or something like that, that's more definitive. Uh, so, basically then, uh, if you've got this system and the surroundings and things are, cha um, uh, things are changing, then the entropy of the total thing will go up. It is possible that the system goes down. So uh, when we're asking for the entropy change of the system, you can see from this formula here that, uh, that if, the, if they put an energy into the system, it's going up. If you take an energy out of the system, it's going down, yes. Uh, so uh, the change in entropy uh, depends on whether you're putting, putting heat in or taking heat out, essentially. Um, when we're talking about this reversible uh, process here. Uh, you could have other things going on. Uh, this is the okay, so what, that is, that is, um, that is um, fine. This is slightly diff these are different ways of writing the, the second law of thermodynamics. They're kind of more useful ways, it turns out. Uh, what I want to do, I want to go back and look at uh, the, heat, the heat engine again, uh, with a view to um, analysing that with this new version. So now we know about entropy, uh, can we see what's happening with the heat engines? Uh, I didn't prove the statements about uh, the reversible engines being more efficient. Uh, uh, they're in the appendix, but um, yeah, I didn't prove it because the proof is Okay, we can do it, but and uh, it's there for your own reading. But once you've read it, you'll probably forget all about it. Uh, but but now we're armed with entropy. Uh, can we see what's going on uh, with that? So let us look at uh, the Kelvin-Planck statements. The Kelvin-Planck uh, statement, wasn't it? And I'm not going to state the statement, but what it was really about, it had this situation of a, of a, a reservoir feeding into an engine. Uh, there's our engine, Q1, uh, there's our reservoir, and um, work was being done, WS, uh, essentially, and we've got some, it's a continuously uh, cyclic process, it's taken place. Uh, we had T1 was the temperature of the of our reservoir. Um, and the question I want to ask is, um, as far as the engine and the surroundings are concerned, what is the change in entropy of them? Can we work it out? Uh, so let me put a little diagram, a little thing around this thing. This is my engine. Uh, and also around the... Um, around the reservoir, can I do that? That's my universe. Uh, so, or you, or you can imagine this is isolated if you want, but essentially this is the, nothing's, nothing's coming in and out of this thing, but energy's leaving the reservoir. Uh, and what I want to do, of course, is apply the, uh, the appropriate equation. Uh, we've got this equation. So I want to work out the change in entropy uh, of the reservoir, it's constant temperature. So any heat transfer, out the reservoir uh, would satisfy, I would suggest it satisfies um, this equation uh, because the temperature, the heat flow is a, uh, given driven by a constant temperature. To get heat out of there, you might argue that there's a slight temperature gradient needed in this reservoir to do that. Uh, but for the reservoir then, it's only got a constant temperature, any heat flow must be reversible uh, because of a you know, slightly tip the balance of the gradient that's involved, uh, um, then it would it reverse, yes. So for the reservoir, it's going to be uh, the delta, let's call it delta S1, uh, is equal to, uh, it's losing heat, so it's going to be minus Q1 over T1, yes, that's what this thing would do, right? So that's it. So what I'm doing, I'm taking this relationship and I'm integrating it to give me a, a difference. Yes, so that's a finite relationship. And obviously the T is constant at T1. 
Um, uh, and this integrated gives me the Q, of course. That's what uh, that's what it is. So for the reservoir, the change in entropy for the reservoir is um, is minus Q one over T one. What about the engine? Well, this is the engine. Uh, as far as the engine's concerned, um, it's uh, um, it, it itself must not. Well, it's it's going through a cycle, yes. So for the engine, if I call it delta E, as E, then that thing is essentially uh, zero, um, uh, because the what's going on, of course, is that the uh, the, the substance, uh, the um, thermofluid, is going under cycle. There's no change in entropy of that. It must. Uh, if I, I, I think I mentioned last time. Into a snapshot of the, uh, uh, if you look at spatially around the around the where the fluid the fluid is, going through the combustion chamber, going through the condenser, whatever it's doing. Um, spatially, it's the same. The temperature doesn't change. The, the properties don't change uh, uh, at any point. Uh, so, as a sum, we could argue that the um, the uh, the um, the engine itself. Um, does not um, um, does not change in entropy because of that. So the total entropy of this thing, so ent the entropy at delta S for my universe, if you like, is equal to uh, delta S1 uh, plus delta SE, which is equal to minus Q1 over T1. And that thing, we're we can see is less than zero. Well, that's 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 that is um, contrary to what we're seeing here. Um, you know, the, the, the it is a spontaneous process. The uh, operation of an engine, isn't it? It's between two uh, two temperatures, and heat flux is heat is transferred from the hot to the cool. This is what's dri driving engines, after all. Uh, and um, it has to be positive, we've been told. It has to be positive and it's negative. So this is not possible. This is not possible. Uh, so the Kelvin Planck version uh, is true. Our statement uh, that you can't have that uh, can be shown um, that um, it is the case when we think about entropy. Uh, the entropy of the engine cannot be changing. The reservoir itself uh, does change, even though it's constant temperature. Uh, it is losing, it is transferring entropy after all. As a transfer, this is um, our exchange, isn't it? This is the exchange entropy. And we say in this, uh, it's a constant temperature gradient, so uh, we're saying that's done reversibly. Uh, what about the Clausius version? Let's have a look at that one. Clausius. So Clausius, uh, what was Clausius? He went, he went for something like this, he said T1, uh, we've got our engine, um, and well, it's gonna be, it's gonna go this way, isn't it? Uh, not reversible. Um, T2, um, Q1, Q2. Uh, so let's have a look at that. We, um, Clausius said this was not possible, basically, that you couldn't, uh, this is the cold body, this is the hot body, that you, you uh, no machine or device operating on a cycle uh, can be designed, can be created, that would uh, take heat out of a cold body and supply it uh, to a hot body uh, in this way. And, uh, and what we can do then is look again at the at the various compartments. We can look at the engine. This is all the engine, say. Uh, so that's the engine. Um, we've got our reservoir. And we've got the reservoir, essentially. So that's our universe as far as this is concerned. And what do we get? We get that for the top reservoir, delta S1, let's call it that, 
is equal to, uh, in this we have positive, yes, Q1 over T1, yes. Uh, so the, the entropy of the reservoir is increasing. The entropy of the engine, uh, again, we're going to argue, we're not looking at it, we don't need to look at it because it's not changing, it's, uh, it's going on a cycle. Uh, so we have, to, we have to argue it's zero. Uh, no matter what changes, not the details of it, if you start looking at it, you think, well, it's not possible. Well, that's just another way to get the same argument. But uh, as far as we're concerned, it's going on a cycle. It can't be ch no change going on there. Uh, and then del S2, this reservoir is equal to, well, it's losing energy. So that's going to be minus Q2 over T2. That's what we get uh, for that. So the total change, which is delta S, delta S, the total change for the universe is equal to delta S1, of course, delta S1 plus delta S E plus delta S2. And we find that is equal to Q1 over T1 plus zero plus or minus then in this case, minus Q2 over T2. This is, this is what we find then. Um, but also we know that we can apply the first law to this uh, and, um, uh, and for our engine, and we can see that uh, Q1 is equal to Q2. Yes, that must, be, that must be true. So this is equal to Q, let's call it Q1. Uh, we've got one over T minus one over T2. 1 over T1, sorry. Yes, we've got that. Um, and I can slightly rewrite that if you want, but you can write this as Q1. Uh, doing a bit of algebra, we get uh, uh, T1, T2 times T2 minus T1. Yes, that's the, that's the uh, just multiplying everything out. Uh, but T2 is less than T1. Yeah, T1 is the high temperature, T2. And again, that says that's less than zero, yes? Uh, for T2, uh, less than T1. Which again contravenes the, this statement of the second law. Uh, the entropy of our universe um, has to be positive, uh, uh, essentially, or zero in the limits. Then we've got reversible things. Uh, but this is saying it's uh, so Klaus, uh, 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 Clausius uh, basically said this was not possible. Well, we can see why because uh, it contravenes the second, this version of the second law. This is, a ver this is a version of the second law, but essentially the same statement uh, in that case. Um, what about a reversible then? Let's have a so this is. This is uh, all very good, uh, but what about, um, if I could, can I do the analysis of a reversible heat engine? Uh, yeah, let's have a look at that. Um, so reversible. What happens in uh, in that particular case? Well, let's have a look. We've got uh, T1, uh, we've got our engine, ER in this case, E1, um, T2, Q2, and we've got shaft work coming out of this thing. And again, I'm going to look at uh, what's happening? We've got, um, uh, uh, let's consider these various, uh, the system, the reservoir, and this reservoir. Let's consider these things and, and investigate what they are. And again, we find that, okay, energy is coming out. So we've got delta S1 minus this time, isn't it? Minus Q1 over T1, delta SE. Is equal to zero, no change of entropy, total entropy in the engine. Uh, and delta S2 
uh, that's uh, is equal to uh, plus q1 over oops q2 over t2 and uh, the change in entropy of the universe is delta s it's equal to uh, delta s1 plus delta s e plus delta s2 and that's equal to uh, minus q1 over t1 uh, plus q2 over t2 okay uh, but we know do we not that um, for a reversible for a reversible engine that q1 uh, well q2 over t2 equals q1 over uh, t1 yes um, are we well that's well, what we the way we add it uh, i think was q uh, q2 over q1 equals t2 over t1 we have this was the statement uh from uh, that we found between for reverse blanchard and of course what i can do then i can see that uh, uh t1 so I can see that if I make the Q1 over there, T down there, then this thing is in fact equal to zero. Uh, so what we're finding uh, for the reversible heat engine, that uh, as far as the universe is concerned, uh, there's, no, there's no production of entropy uh, in, that, in that particular case. Uh, and this is the reason why it's turned out to be the best. Uh, as far as that's concerned. Well, just to show that it is the best, let's have a look at the, uh, an, uh, just the ordinary situation uh, where we've got an action, you know, an irreversible machine, irreversible heat engine. Uh, so, so our irreversible then, So for an irreversible heat engine, um, what have we got? Same thing, of course, it's, the analysis is essentially the same. Um, there's our engine, T2, uh, Q1 coming in, Q2 coming out. Uh, there's our engine. Um, again, I want to analyze the entropy, total entropy changes of this thing. There's our reservoir, what does that do? Now there's our engine. What does that do? And there's the reservoir. Uh, the exact same analysis, of course. But here we're going to apply the second law of thermodynamics. So we'll look at the, uh, what we have to have for this. Uh, we've got delta S1 is equal to minus Q1 over T1. Uh, there's no change in, as far as the engine is concerned. Uh, we've got delta S2. Is equal to uh, Q2 over T2, uh, and the total has to be greater or equal to zero. So delta S, which is equal to delta S1, plus delta SE, plus delta S2, has to be equal, greater or equal to zero. This is what we've, this is what we've been told uh, to satisfy the second law of thermodynamics, uh, and this is equal to minus. Uh, Q1 over T1 plus zero um, uh, plus Q2 uh, over T2. And that thing has to be greater or equal to zero. Um, well, what we can do, we can say, okay, uh, let's, let's, that implies then um, now let's take this to the other side. It's, so it's minus minus Q1 uh, over T1 uh, is greater or equal to minus Q2 uh, over T2. That's what that's telling me. Um, yes. Uh, and what, what we can do about that, we can... Um, we can bring the Q2 over this side and the T1 on that. So let's let's rearrange that and say minus Q1 over Q2 um, is uh, greater or equal to uh, 
no, no, let's, no, let's not do yes, 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 yes. Well, uh, no, actually, we won't do that. Let's do it the other way. Let's, uh, so I've got, um, I've got, um, yeah, so let's, uh, let's bring it the other way around, shall we? So what I'm going to do then, I'm just going to switch the formula around a little bit. So we've got, uh, well, leave it as it is for the time being. So we're going to bring uh, T2 to this side over T1. That's greater than or equal to, uh, we're going to bring the minus Q2 over Q1. So let's let's do it that way. Um, uh, and, and what I'm going to do then is add one to each side. I'm going to add one to each side, so I get one minus uh, T2 over T1 is greater than or equal to uh, 1 minus Q2 over Q1. Yeah, that's how it, that looks about right. This thing is the efficiency of a reversible heat engine, isn't it? This is the efficiency of the engine. Remember, that's our efficiency. So this is the thermal efficiency, theta, and this thing is the thermal efficiency um, of our reversible engine. Uh, so what we found is that the second law is telling me that the, uh, that the thermal efficiency of any engine is less than equal to the thermal efficiency of the reversible heat engine. Um, and why is it why is it the case? Well, we see now why it's the case. Uh, in the in the irreversible case, uh, we find that entropy is being produced. Uh, with the production of entropy, what it generally means is you've lost work. The capacity to work uh, has been lost. Um, it's, it's as I say, it's equivalent to the temperature gradient going down. Um, and the gradients can be used to produce work, and essentially when it flattens, you've lost that potential. Uh, and uh, so this is essentially, I didn't prove it, this is a slightly, this is a different proof. I didn't prove it uh, using the sort of Carnot principle at the time, but this is when you've got entropy, you can prove these things. And sure, therefore, that the reversible situation is the most efficient situation um, and you get this equality by a very simple analysis uh, using entropy. Um, so there we go. Okay, so that's uh, so that's the, uh, in, uh, the using the the new understanding of entropy to analyze the heat engines. Uh, I want to do another uh, analysis of the heat engines as well while I'm on. Um, uh, well, we're going to introduce the TS diagram. That's the first thing I want to do. And then we'll apply that again to the heat engine to uh, uh, to give us a bit more insight to what's going on in the engine, in the reversible engine. Uh, so we look at a cycle called the Carnot cycle, which um, which produces uh, uh, um, uh, well produces the maximum work you can uh, from one of these engines. So. So at the moment we're sort of looking at it. We're not looking at the details inside the engine, but I want to I want to get into the engine itself to, to show also that um, uh, that uh, why what, to give a little bit, a bit more insight into why you're getting these uh, efficiencies that you're getting with these things. So let's look at the the TS diagram, uh, TS uh, state diagram. Why, did, why are we interested in this diagram? Uh, previously, we, we looked at uh, state diagrams and PV was the one we were interested in. PV turned out to be, and just to remind ourselves, our PV diagram uh, was like this. Uh, and we can imagine going from one point to another uh, state point to that on this diagram. But one of the things we found that... Uh, if we looked at an elemental uh, area of this thing under the diagram, uh, where this is dV, yeah, then P dV, this is P of course, the height of this thing, uh, and we had our formula delta WR was, uh, delta W, sorry, displacement, sorry, D, delta WD, our displacement work 
was equal to uh, P dV, yes. So this was quite a useful diagram for us because um, we could see that the, the work from going from state point one to state point two in an expansion process um, was the area under this curve. Uh, in fact, it was it led us to deduce that, in fact, the curve mattered, which uh, made uh, work not a property. Uh, so that was one thing. So that was one use. Um, but we have a similar thing here because we have now a, a nice formula. We have uh, that delta, we have that t ds, uh, well, a little ds, so like that, the delta qr over t. This is what we've got, isn't it? Delta qr over t. So I've divided through, I've got, I've divided through by mass here, so it's in for the specific terms, um, uh, which we can do, of course. Um, and so this is, this looks very similar. Uh, we've got delta qr then. Uh, is equal to uh, TDS. TDS, um, so we've got that nice little formula there. Uh, and we can always plot one property against another. We can just choose which ones we are, we've got the, uh, what we can look at. And therefore, a, a quite a useful one then, a similar diagram, is the TS diagram, T versus S, specific. Uh, and we can imagine a curve uh, again, going from one to two, any direction you like, it doesn't really matter. Um, and we could look at the a little area under this thing, uh, where this is ds, uh, the thickness of that, uh, the height is t, and we're finding therefore that the area under the curve, of course, is the heat supplied. Well, the heat supplied reversibly, do you have to watch this. So that area, uh, delta Q of R, uh, is equal to TDS. So when I integrate, when I've, got a, I've got a plot, a curve plotted on your um, TS diagram, uh, it turns out the area under that curve is the heat supplied reversibly, reversibly. So that's an important uh, juncture. If it's irreversible, you can't you can't do this. So this is this is more certainly for a reversible thing. So it's very much like similar. So we've got a similar situation uh, we had with our with our uh, PV diagram. Uh, we've got a similar situation. Uh, uh, a quite important curve. We're going to look look at some of the important curves. One of them, which I want to have a look at at the moment, is. Uh, uh, when you get this situation, TDS, where you go from uh, vertically down, so if you imagine that, and this is at some S value, of course, sorry, not DS, TS. Uh, when you've got uh, this situation, um, and of course, in this situation, uh, if I was applying this formula, this this curve, of course, the s is equal to zero. This is the this is um, uh, there's no change in uh, in entropy. Uh, such a process going from one to two. So that process there is an isentropic isentropic process. And that, it happens at it happens quite a lot, and we've come across it already when we. We were talking about the turbines, compressors, and such devices. We were saying, oh, the entropy uh, is constant. It's isentropic, therefore. They were, they were following this particular line. Um, uh, and what we have, uh, if, if we have a process that's reversible and adiabatic, so reversible would mean, if I had a, a process that's reversible, uh, um, would be satisfying this formula. Yes, so a reversible process would satisfy this formula where we apply the heat reversibly. Um, um, and of course, if it's adiabatic, then there's no heat supplied at all, so that would be equal to zero. Uh, so a reversible, so reversible, so reversible, uh, sorry, reversible. Reversible plus adiabatic P 
gives uh, isentropic. Yeah. So quite often then for heat exchanges, not heat exchanges, for turbines and compressors, we say they're reversible in adiabatic. We were adiabatic machines, you may recall. Uh, and we were arguing the reversible, uh, which meant exactly this, that the uh, that you get an isotropic process. So if you've got a reversible and adiabatic process, then it's this kind of, it's, uh, it's this line, and that's an isentropic process. Um, if you've got an isentropic process, it doesn't necessarily mean that you've got a reversible and adiabatic process, because in general, of course, we have ds is equal to, um, well, it is little ds, um, delta q over t uh, plus delta i, yeah, uh, is given by that that thing. Isentropic, of course, means this is zero. So for isentropic, this is zero. Yeah. So reversible and adiabatic. We have reversible and adiabatic. Reversible means that's zero. Adiabatic means that's zero. Therefore, that's zero. If you come to the other, other if you come to this one, say, okay, this is isentropic. That's zero. Now it depends whether. Uh, it's adiabatic or not because um, uh, all you've got in that case, so isentropic uh, means uh, ds is zero, and we've got delta q, of course, uh, over t is equal to minus delta i s, yes, um, which may or may not be zero. So generally, this would be not equal to zero. So it's going to be less than zero, it turns out. Uh, so you, you may not have adiabatic, but certainly if you've got reversible and adiabatic, you've definitely got isentropic. You can go that way, but not necessarily the other way. Uh, you need to know more. Uh, you need to know that it's actually reversible. Uh, so yes, I mean, uh, yeah, if you had isentropic and reversible, that would be zero, and then you can say it's adiabatic. That, that would be true. Uh, in this case. So the TS diagram is, is actually quite useful. Um, uh, it's actually quite a useful diagram. Uh, and what I want to do then, I'm going to apply, we're going to come back to it uh, and look at some curves on that. Um, uh, uh, which, uh, uh, but this one is interesting, isentropic. This, uh, this is called an isentrope, this line, by the way, the name for everything, I guess, isentropes. Uh, the, the, the constant line, uh, the vertical line on the TS diagram is called isentrope. Uh, we've got um, isentropic process. Uh, so that's that. Uh, isothermal process, by the by, of course, would be a horizontal line. So that would be if you're there, uh, isothermal, of course. An isothermal process. Um, what I want to do then, I just want to go back to the heat engine again. Uh, and have a look inside at a, at a possible cycle, uh, and uh, and again uh, look at how we get to uh, uh, the efficiency of uh, each engine, uh, for something called a Cano cycle. So uh, I'm going to use the TS diagram to do that. So well, this is the last thing I want to do today. Uh, is look at this. Um, next week we'll get to. Uh, the gases, I think that's the last thing I've got to do next time, uh, maybe next week. <laughs> so let's let's go, let's look at the heat engines again. Uh, the last time, <laughs> uh, and imagine uh, a cycle, I'm going to imagine a cycle on our CS diagram. Uh, what I'm going to imagine, first of all, what I'm going to imagine is um, uh, we can imagine using using um, using uh, vapor, for instance. Um, and I'm going to draw uh, this curve, which you may remember for um, for um, TV. Uh, we drew it, but it's also true here. Um, the uh, we can draw it on here. Uh, and uh, and we can draw. Um, so this is the saturated liquid line. This is a critical point a week before. This is the saturated vapor line. And I'm going to consider a process on here, 
of isotherms and isotropic uh, processes. So I'm going to consider essentially, let's have a look at it. I want to go along here horizontally at constant temperatures. This generally would be a phase change. When you've got a phase change, you're, uh, you're going from liquid over here, remember, uh, to vapour over here. Liquid plus vapour in, in this region. Uh, and I want to consider going around a cycle. Uh, and this is my cycle. I'm going to do this. So I'm going to go down along there. Uh, let's just draw the line in and join these things up. Uh, so this is a very special cycle. I'm going to label this thing A, B, C, D. Uh, uh, so these, so what we've got is A, B is an isothermal process, yes. An isotherm, so A, B and C, D are isotherms. Um, uh, that's for certain. Uh, this is the high temperature. Um, uh, so we've got, uh, I don't know what to call that. Uh, so get the liquid out the road. But uh, uh, So this thing comes along. Uh, uh, let's call this T1. Let's call this T2, yeah. Uh, the, the high temperature T1 and that. So they are isotherms, cause of temperature. Uh, and we're going to imagine taking our system round this cycle. Uh, and let's... Uh, this thing, uh, well, S, uh, SA and SB, I suppose I could call it that. Also, also SD and SC, they're the same uh, in this case. Um, so that's, that's a, a possible cycle I can go around. Um, what I'm thinking about, uh, moving my vapour a bit, what I'm thinking about is a heat engine, really, a T1. Uh, and I imagine uh, a cycle for my heat engine, T2, uh, giving off work, WS. Uh, so again, I'm imagining there's a process happening. Uh, and remember, we have, uh, well, we have our Q1 and Q2 uh, for our heat engine. And I imagine that the, 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 Thermal fluids is going around a cycle, and the cycle it's going to go around is this one I've drawn here. So I've got two isotherms and two isentropes. Uh, yeah. So that's what I've got in this process. Uh, but we also know uh, that uh, uh, this is a we imagine a, a reversible adiabatic process here, uh, and we've got a, I've got a constant temperature. T1, so we imagine a transfer uh, at a constant temperature that again is reversible. Uh, so, uh, and each is going to be rejected at a lower temperature, T2, which would be Q2. Again, that's reversible. And we've got a, a reversible adiabatic process, isentropic process, um, which is uh, so this thing is actually reversible. This is a reversible, uh, it's called a Carno cycle. Uh, Carno cycle. This is what it's called, a special cycle. Um, but what do we know then? Let's have a look at the uh, the energy transfers in this thing. Um, uh, as we go, let's go start from here then. Uh, so we can see that uh, we had our formula, didn't we? That um, uh, uh, that uh, uh, the S is equal to delta Q R over T. Alternatively. Uh, that implies that delta QR uh, is equal to TDS, yeah? Uh, so the amount of energy then supplied as you move from A to B, um, uh, which is essentially Q1, of course, uh, is just the integration of this, this result, yes? So we have the... Uh, um, so integrating this result, we find that Q... Uh, let's, let's drop the R for a second. Let's drop the R. So QAB, uh, can I write it? QAB uh, is equal to uh, T1, T1, uh, SB minus SA, yes? 
Yeah, so that's the, just integrating this result tells me the energy that's, uh, it's the area under this thing, this is the area, that area there, the, the heat flux for that one is the um, is that. There's no heat in this version, yes, uh, work maybe, but not heat, so there's no, there's no change uh, in that. And the only other heat I've got is uh, this one, which is Q, Q, uh, CD, and that's equal to T2, uh, SA, or SD, uh, well it's SD minus SC, but that's also equal to SA, SA minus SB, yeah, that's given by that particular thing, yes, um, we're going around a cycle, of course, going around a cycle, uh, so what what do we know about something when we go around a cycle? We know that the work done, the shaft work, uh, must be uh, well. We must have that delta from the first law, from the first law. We have that uh, delta W S is equal to delta Q. Yes. That's what the first law says, as, uh, as we, um, uh, because there's no, there's no, there's no change in internal energy, is, is there? So that's the, um, um, uh, as we go around the site, the sum, well, there's a sum of that, yeah, the sum of that, so, sorry. Let's, let's make it perfectly right. <laughs> so as we go around the cycle, the delta uh, uh, W, is equal to, uh, the, uh, let's write it like that, this just uh, as we go around a cycle, this is the, this is dual statement, yes, um, for the thing, um, uh, and the, this is just the sum of the work, and this is, so this is, this is the sum of the heat, sorry, that's equal to the work, so the work, uh, the WS then, omega S, is equal to the sum, is equal to these things, Q, uh, A, B, uh, plus Q C D uh, and what does that give me uh, well that you can see is the that switch that's a negative of that so we can bring out um, we can bring out S B minus S A it seems to me uh, that's true uh, and we get uh, T1 uh, minus T2 yes um, so that's the work, uh, just by applying the first law of thermodynamics, uh, summing up everything, um, we, get, we get this result. Uh, and then we ask, uh, what's the efficiency? Remember what the efficiency was? The efficiency uh, is, is the work supplied, yes, uh, over... Um, so what we want out for what we want out from the system is the work, which is WS, and what we put into the system is heat transfer, which was Q1, which is in our case is uh, this one, isn't it? QAB. Uh, so this is QAB. So that's the heat supplied, uh, and we put everything in. Uh, we find that that's equal to SB minus SA times uh, T1 minus T2 over um, this one, which is T1 times uh, SB minus SA. Yeah, and the F, this cancels with that. We're left with T1 minus T2 over T1. That finally gives me 1 minus uh, T2 over T1, uh, which is the efficiency of a reversible engine, isn't it? This is what we this is this is what we find. Uh, that is the efficiency of uh, a reversible engine. So the Carnot cycle. It's not a again these uh, this is <laughs> they're not practical cycles uh, to be honest with you. There's other cycles you get onto more uh, realistic cycles when you get onto the second year. Um, but this is just demonstrating 
uh, sort of closing the loop on uh, on heat engines uh, for a particular cycle are reversible. Everything's reversible here. Uh, isotherms, heat supplied or heat rejected on isotherm, work put in or work taken out uh, in, a, in an isentropic uh, expansion or contraction. Uh, I said, yeah, um, process, versibly um, adiabatic processes, um, then we find that uh, when we look at the efficiency of such a thing, that we find we actually get the formula that we uh, gave uh, right uh, when we looked at heat engines. We get back to the same thing, but a bit more of analysis. Uh, we've actually specified exactly what the, what the material, you have to imagine a little bit of material basically going around this thing, uh, being subjected to T, temperature T1 down here, uh, and then coming back and being subjected to T2 uh, along here and, and following this particular cycle. So, as you imagine, a little piece of material going around the cycle. Uh, as a whole, of course, the whole thing doesn't change. You know, the material there, if I look at the spatial point, then uh, of course the temperatures don't change. So. Uh, when I was saying the entropy of the, of the engine doesn't change, and what I'm talking about is the overall thing. Uh, a little bit of material, of course, it sees change. It sees it's moving, after all, and being subjected to different regimes, different temperatures, and so forth. Okay, well, that's, I think, is where I wanted to get to today. Uh, that finishes more uh, the analysis of heat engines. I have one last thing to do on the, uh, as far as the course is concerned, I need to look at. Uh, entropy as a property, um, because in fact that's the way we apply it. Okay, it's in the steam tail, but what happened when we've got a gas? It turns out we can come up with some really nice little formulas that give us the entropy. Uh, given the state, the equation of state, we can work out the entropy uh, uh, very nicely. And I need to also look again at TS diagrams, uh, look at some particular processes. Uh, so I'll say goodbye. Bye bye.